Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome all of you to Nemo's first webinar in 2024. I see a lot of familiar names in the chat. I'm super happy and also new names. Um, the first webinar in 2024, Connect and Grow, Effective Digital Storytelling in Museums. I'm very excited to welcome our today's facilitator, Medavi Gandhi from India, though based in Berlin at the moment. Medavi is the founder of the Heritage Lab, a digital media platform where she connects her love for storytelling and the arts. Medavi, we're happy to hear two more sentences from you about the Heritage Lab and your work in a minute. My name is Mira. I work for NEMO, the network for museums in Europe. And one of our main activities is to provide trainings, free training opportunities uh, for our members, such as this webinar, but we also offer trainings and workshop, workshops several times a year online and on site. We also offer a mentoring program for museum educators. Um, there's a lot going on, especially this year. So please check out our website or subscribe to our newsletter uh, to be up to date for those events. Uh, and right now we have a call for application for a one year free membership uh, at NEMOS. So that's great. <laughs> Before I hand over to Medavi, um, I want you, the participants, to know that uh, we have the opportunity to ask questions to Medavi at the end of the session with a Q&A round. And we do that uh, via the chat function. Um, if you have questions in between, you can always write them in the chat. I will collect them and hand them over to Medavi at the end. And now I'm excited to hear more about this super important topic of digital storytelling in museums. Connect and grow. Medavi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mira. And it is great to be here. What an honor to be your first um, webinar facilitator for 2024. Um, I, I actually didn't think of it. So thank you so much for um, having me uh, start your 2024 series of webinars. I'm also really uh, excited to um, have all of you from all across Europe. I'm seeing the chat and it's filling as it fills up and I see that Everyone's joining us from Hungary, Finland, Serbia, Roman Romania, Belgium, so many different places that I have not been to. But I hope that someday I am uh, able to meet you in person, some of you in person as well. Um, so as um, uh, Mira already introduced me, I'm the founder of the Heritage Lab. Um, before that, I worked with artisans and craftspeople across India and started a nonprofit called Happy Hands. And I realized that both of these actually did deal with a lot of storytelling because um, in crafts is, you know, just the engagement with crafts and folk arts is also about understanding what stories have been important to communities and how do we, um, you know, communicate that to uh, a certain audience that might then become patrons for artisans and craftspeople by buying their work and supporting handmade so that um, that was also something that I worked on, and it's actually that work that led me into museums because museums were spaces for inspiration for a lot of the artisans and craftspeople I was working with. And the idea was to see and learn from the stories that uh, their ancestors have told, uh, have shared and in different formats and forms, and see how they can work on them and you know deliver a more innovative experience of their stories. So that's how I started to actually work with museums in India. And um, the digital space is something that has uh, been really fascinating to me because it allowed me, just as this moment right now, to network and share these with a range of people from everywhere. Uh, when I started the nonprofit also, uh, crafts were not something that were discussed online a lot and a lot, a large part of my work was to look at public engagement in the digital space uh, with artisans and crafts people. So um, in a way, it all really came together beautifully at the Heritage Lab. And uh, just as I say the Heritage Lab, you might wonder why is it a lab? Because really it was an experiment and it continues to be. Uh, except that now uh, the experiments are really targeted towards stories. How do museums tell stories? What stories are resonating with um, people from different communities? 
how can communities participate in storytelling? Um, these are just some of the endeavors that um, we seek to study in a way. Um, each story that we publish is a study for us. We try to understand who read this, why was it important to them? So uh, while it is great and exciting to share these stories, it's also really nice to be able to dig into the insights behind these stories, um, which can further help institutions, cultural institutions especially, to build on their stories. So that's really what I do at the Heritage Lab. Uh, we see what formats are working, whether video is better, do memes work with a certain audience, you know, what are the different kinds of stories that uh, people really love and what brings people closer to museums. Um, I myself am a fan of museums since I was little because my father forced me to go into a museum. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how it began for me. So I'm really excited to be here and share everything that I've been learning along the way. So um, I'm happy to also take your questions and uh, I will do my best to answer those. And um, yeah, let's get started. Um, in today's presentation, we are talking about digital storytelling. And one of the interesting things that I found was every year there is a research on internet trends and internet consumption, and I love looking at those. And um, something that's really striking to me is that people spend an average of six and a half hours online. Um, but if one goes deeper into what this internet trend is doing, like what are people doing online really, um, especially because there is another statistic which is equally fascinating that the human attention span has dropped to 8%. So it makes me wonder that if we are only paying attention, if our attention span is limited to eight seconds, then what is happening in those six and a half hours really? So the, the some of the top things that um, are listed according to this research, and I've provided a link um, in the presentation, this is, um, this is uh, usually done uh, every year in October, the report is published. So this is the latest um, from 2023. So what people like to do is find information. That's what they use the internet for. And I find these to be the opportunities for us to tell stories when we are a cultural institution or when we are telling cultural stories to understand what is our audience really doing um, online. A lot of people also like to learn and, you know, look at how to videos, whether it's how to make up and how to do hairstyles. That's that's all good. But as long as they're looking for something to learn, that's quality that's important to I think remember that that's what people are here for how to videos and um, then there is education um, there are people who like to, to study courses um, this is not in an order but um, finding information and learning are some of the top goals education and um, browsing randomly are some of the you know least um, spent I mean people spend the least time on these two activities where they just browsing in spare time for nothing really. A lot of the time is now taken up by streaming online shows, listening to music and so on. I didn't put that here, but I felt that these are great opportunities for us to look at how we can plug in our stories. Um, a lot of my friends are very, very fond of those hairstyle videos and yoga videos, both that I, I mean, I love the yoga videos for a simple reason that I, I can't follow yoga really well. But a study of these videos told me that there was something really similar about them. And what was similar was that as someone consuming these videos, I feel even if I don't know how to, you know, make a yoga pose, I feel like, oh, I have exercised, you know, just looking at someone do it. And if I don't know how to draw really well, it gives me immense satisfaction to see that someone painted something in a really quick video. So the essence that I understand is that it's the digital way of sharing something gives audiences an aspiration that, hey, I could do this now that I know this. Or, you know, when you're seeing like a cooking video, you, you don't always cook that, but you love seeing what recipes went in and feel, oh, this could be simple. So what the Heritage Lab actually does is see where we can draw these kind of notes and comparisons and then share them with museums as insights to just see how their stories can also start to um, touch a chord with their own audience that they hope to uh, speak with. 
So in today's presentation, really, we are going to talk about how we are going to create a digital storytelling strategy and how we can frame these stories for a certain community. Uh, what we actually do is that we delve into how uh, digital story, what the power of digital storytelling can be and how it can be used to, you know, captivate our audience and connect them with the institution's um, ethos, with the institution's mission, how we can really convert them from being an audience to being a community, really. And um, if you see this image here, there's a, there's a bunch of children looking into a bioscope which have these little movie stills playing. And um, here we also see a storyteller using a scroll to share a story. So in a sense, I guess stories have existed for a really long time and it's just the medium and the format that keeps changing um, as the audience changes and as their preferences change. So um, if I have to say it in one word, it's really an experiment of understanding who our target audience is when it comes to digital. Um, so before we begin, and before we begin to talk about how we use um, stories to build a community, I want to ask you to take a moment and uh, just share it in chat. How important is community building to you at this point, whether you're, you're doing it professionally or personally? Um, how important is community building for you at this stage? And maybe even a little line on why is it important to you? So if you're starting a newsletter, for example, go ahead, just tell me that, you know, you're starting a newsletter and that's why community building is important to you. Um, so I'm going to wait to hear from you. And um, well, I can see the numbers coming in and I do hope that the sound issues have cleared up for those who could not hear. Mm -hmm. I really like this response that it's part of a community and it's important for us to build a healthy, democratic and critical society, critic society. We exist for the community, connecting people who are back home and people who have moved abroad. Mm -hmm. I really like these responses uh, because some of them are so nice and specific. It's really great to know that you're already so you know, specific about who your audience is and who your community is. Because sometimes for museums, it can be a very difficult uh, way to point out who their exact community is because there are several communities that museums can have, um, should have even. And there are different um, target audiences, like there is the educator community, there's general civil society and the public, there are young people, um, artists, just so many different kinds of audiences. Okay, great. So what we do is, as your responses also come in, we'll look at four different stories, all in video format, um, because I, I chose Instagram Reels right now, because even though, you know, storytelling is an ancient form and we know that it's just the latest form here, Reels and short videos. Um, the principles of storytelling remain the same, but this is just a different format. So I would like to share these four stories with you and then ask you to point out what you found to be similar between all of them. I'd also share that these are some of the most um, successful stories in a way. So for instance, um, the third story that you see here, that you will see uh, would, you know, have around 328,000 viewers. So just what do you think made it successful? So just take a look at the videos. They're really short and they don't have a lot of text or anything.
Okay. So I'm just going to recap a little. In the first video, you saw like there were these really different, you know, themes um, from these are all India based in a way. So they shared different scenes from different cities, uh, popular locations even. The second one is about you're looking at the first colored photograph and a little zoom in about that. And the third one is about um, one of India's most popular artists, um, his, uh, his home. So that's going to be converted into a museum. So a look at his home in a very, uh, it, nobody has ever discovered his home really or seen it from the insides. And the fourth one is about the second largest painting in the world that is exhibited at one of um, the museums in India. So um, I'm hearing some of the things. So using social media language as POV, yes. You make the information really fast and captions are direct, okay. Um, anything else? What is common with the stories in, in, in a narrative structure maybe? Any guesses there? Making a connection to reality, okay. An invitation to discover more and structure information. Okay, great. So this can help me move ahead perhaps. And this is excellent. Uh, people being able to relate to the story, for example, the house. Thank you for that. Um, that. That's really interesting because that's the crux of it. How do we make this relatable and accessible? Um, so one of the things about any amazing story that you might remember from your childhood also, just think about it. If you did, you'd realize that a story can engage our emotions. And that's that's what we strive to do. So in today's presentation, that's also what we're looking at, that how do these stories engage our emotions? Um, the, the second layer of the question is that what kind of information um, are we wanting should remain memorable for the audience? That's something that will depend on relatability. So for instance, somebody uh, finds that house, um, it's a thing about nostalgia in a way. You're seeing an old house, that kind of architecture doesn't really exist. But at some point, all grandparents' homes, etc., looked that kind of, that way. And a lot of the comments on that video actually attested to that, saying that, hey, um, this used to this this my uncle used to have a home like this and my aunt used to have a home like this so there's that relatability there's a specific demographic that this is people from a particular city in india who relate to that house and its rich cultural heritage that oh my god this artist in his home is in our city great and the the other part is that's like establishing that connection not with just the video or the story but a series of stories that help people establish a connection with your museum because everything that you tell them in some way remains in their memory. It has a recall value. That's what we try to do when we tell a story at the Heritage Lab. So we look at a story, we look at a museum object and we see, okay, what can be something? What is that one piece of information that someone ought to remember about this painting? They may not remember that it was a Russian artist who made this painting or that this was about a particular historic moment, but they might remember that this is the second largest oil painting in the world. It's easy to remember. It doesn't take a lot for the, the person who's consuming the story to remember. And that's their entry into your world. So it's, it's easy for them to enter, but as they are given similar similar stories and as they experience more of these, they start to develop a love for the kind of stories you tell. Which brings me to another aspect about consistency, which I will tackle a little later, but um, that's the thing, that when you're telling the story, you know that, oh, is my audience a beginner? Do they really need basic information first that they need to remember so they can establish a connection with our museum or are they people who are used to coming to the museum a lot and we want to, them to establish a connection with us um, in a different way. So it is really the understanding the audience that will help craft that narrative. That said, it is not important that if you don't have an understanding or research of your audience, you 
shouldn't start to tell a story. What is clear is that the story is meant for a certain audience and not just everybody. When you're starting to tell a story, it's very clear that, okay, this is meant for people of the city of Calcutta so that they can appreciate the house when it is turned into a museum. So it's very clear and very direct that that's what we are looking at. That's the demographic of the audience that we are looking at. Um, there are also sometimes, like for the Heritage Lab, social media channels have been an excellent way to experiment and know our audience. Um, I know that there have been several workshops about social media, a lot of conversation about it as to how to talk on social media and what to post on social media. But the Heritage Lab transitioned from sharing stories on the Heritage Lab's Instagram channel to using these as research material. So we see how did people react? How did a certain kind of set of people, set of audiences, how do they react to the story? Did it reach teachers as we were intending it to, or did it reach a completely different audience that we had managed, we had thought to? So one of the things, one of the foundations of the digital story is that it resonates with people. So who does the content or the story resonate with? In this case, uh, we put out a Mother's Day post. Now, this was supposed to be a really general, generic post that uh, it's a popular story about one of the deities and how his mother is fooling him into believing that, hey, look, I got you the moon. It's right there because he wants the moon and he can't have the moon, <laughs> but his mother is smarter. So this was like a Mother's Day post to say all our mothers fooled us at some point, trying to make us believe it's something that we didn't know at that time that it wasn't true. Now that's relatable. This has happened with almost every child as they've grown up, right? Um, so that worked, but we also discovered that our posts were a source of inspiration for artists. And so this is an 18th, 19th century painting, uh, miniature style that an embroidery artist feels that he can actually use as a textile piece. That's it's it's his inspiration for a textile piece. So it really became clear to us at that point that a lot of our followers were creators and you know artists themselves. And so the next set of our storytelling experiment sought to tell stories about women artists. And um, the Heritage Lab does a lot of Wikipedia editathons. Um, that's like a next level of community because all of the storytelling has led to a point where people want to participate in our storytelling endeavors or our research endeavors. And one way to have them participate and create impact, uh, because everybody who wants to participate wants to see the value of their participation. How have they created impact? So we often hold these uh, Wikipedia editathons on different themes. And for Women's History Month, we decided to um, focus on women artists who were really less known, not known, not enough information about them. So we collaborated with the museum who provided all the information. But the museum was very hesitant to release artworks about these women or, you know, by these women into public domain because of licensing doubts and they just were not sure how to pursue that. We saw this as an excellent opportunity to bring creators from our community into looking at how they can support this endeavor. So what we have are three things here. There is, um, you know, Hashi Rashi Devi was an artist. Uh, her artworks are also hardly visible. So there is, uh, an artist who created a graphic novel about Hashi Rashi. Uh, the second one on the right, um, extreme right, is uh, the group, which is a women's collective um, in the late 19th, early 20th century. And um, I think, I'm not so sure about the period right now, but um, there exists no photograph of them together or their work. So there's another artist who actually used one, the single newspaper article about them to craft their image and start to tell their story in a graphic way. And there's another one um, on the left also about a woman who used embroidery to uh, train a lot of women um, post-partition, you know, who were 
the partition of India who were emerging from a refugee crisis, from poverty. So she used embroidery to help them build their lives. So these are just examples of three stories, but it's the creators that actually came up with these illustrations based on the Wikipedia articles we were writing or the research we were doing, which became crucial for you know, having that kind of a visual language there. And like I was saying, sometimes you really don't know the audience. So for instance, uh, you will see here, um, Mr. William Dalrymple is a really well-respected historian. Um, uh, and he, he decided to share this at a time when the pandemic was upon us and there were a lot of debates about vaccination. This story was written way before that. So one doesn't know at the time that the story was written, um, you know, and shared that, hey, this is a portrait of three princesses who were trying to be brand ambassadors for the government at that time, like for the kingdom at that time. And, uh, you know, they were promoting smallpox vaccination. Um, so that story was taken in context much later, almost a year and a half later after it was first written. So there are some times that you write a story and it doesn't reach the intended audience at first, but it reaches a whole range of other um, advocates, people who might use that as research later, which is the second example. Mr. Prashant Bhushan is a well-known lawyer and advocate in India. And when there's a discussion on environment and banning firecrackers just before a huge festival, um, the history of firecrackers and and that kind of information becomes important for his debate. So we don't know who is using these stories, which is why it is absolutely crucial to ensure that there are facts and figures and the story is substantiated um, well enough. Um, and it's a compelling narrative also uh, you know, for different kinds of audiences. If you see all stories, mostly have a main character, have like some conflict happening and then a resolution. But if you're talking about an object, that may not be true. It can just be, you know, it can start from an emotion. It can start from the discovery of something. It can be completely different, which is why I want to show you this example from the Stadel Museum. This has been one of my absolute favorite um, examples to use when it comes to promoting an exhibition. Um, like we say, like how do we start to captivate the audience and engage them in that first instant when instance when the attention span is eight seconds, right? So if you see here, um, the the first slide of their story is Vincent, is that you? And there is a there's a copy of a self portrait by a contemporary artist. And now this is the thing that. Someone who is not into art, maybe, uh, or is a lot into art, feels that, yeah, okay, I have seen Van Gogh exhibitions. Um, okay, I will visit if I, if I can, you know, that kind of a thing. But here, suddenly, it's appealing to a creator. Um, it's also appealing to someone who's like, hey, it's works of other people who have created um, Van Gogh versions on their own and it might be interesting to see because this is something you haven't seen before as to what is the extent of creativity that people can have with um, existing art so uh, that's something new to discover in another slide they said can't have must have so they're promoting their merchandise yes great but it's not in a very promotional way that hey you will find van gogh merchandise at the exhibition and after the exhibition or special merchandise instead it tells you that, hey, you can't have the painting, but uh, you can have uh, this jacket, which would be great if it's because it's Instagrammable. They're, they're using a certain kind of tone with the audience, and, and that's a tone that they have uh, used to create uh, excitement that, uh, okay, I can, I can go for this. It could also well have been part of a contest that, you know, you might win this or if you come or there's a lucky uh, draw for the exhibition visitors. Who knows? There are different things that different museums have done over time. But this tells me that 
even though I can't buy that jacket, I must want, I must go and see it at least in person. How does it really look? It gets me excited. The third one is an action point. It's, it's telling the audience what to do. They're not passive consumers. They're being told that you can visit, but you can also share your, geo, you can geotag your location. You can uh, put a hashtag. This is what you do to get featured on our Instagram channel, for instance. And then there is um, the simple, sweet message, very direct call to action that says swipe up. I mean, that's the call to action. You're giving them something to do. You're just simply saying, come and see the master with a really tiny um, um, part of, I mean, it's, it's the painting, but it's at a distance. You can't really zoom in and see. So in a way, it's like a short glimpse, but you can't see the detail. You can't see everything because if I saw everything, then how would I, you know, feel motivated to go? So when you see all of these stories, you understand that the audience for this particular story is a local audience that might want to be visiting. The, that's what they're doing. Their mission here is to make the digital visitor visit the exhibition. So it could be the local visitor. Uh, but but the idea is that that's the story that the premise that the story is built on visiting like driving the visiting uh, part of it so there is a certain kind of a mission to crafting that uh, that compelling narrative I'm also happy to share another example that keeps you know becoming a trend in India every few days and this is uh, interesting for us because again this was a simple story. It was meant to just clarify what this sculpture is about because nobody really knows the story behind it. The label just says Mephistopheles, Margareta, Sycamore Wood. That's it. It doesn't say anything else. But we start with stating the obvious. That's another technique in storytelling that you state the obvious and say, this is perhaps the most photographed object at the Salar Jung Museum. And then that line is enough to drive up the curiosity of the reader that, okay, this is the most photographed object. What is it about? And then you tell them that, okay, this has a, you know, it's based on the, the Goethe's Faust. It's a popular story and um, it's a popular drama and how the artist has really interpreted it becomes the rest of the story. But it's clear in bold letters as to this is based on Goethe's first on the concept of good and evil. So if someone is looking for those key words, they immediately want to listen to the rest of the story. And this has become interesting because till that point in time, this narrative had not been shared online at all. There was no information online. So some of the things that we remember while creating a story is that does this narrative um, is this accessible narrative do people already know about it am i sharing a story that people know if yes like for instance people already know the story of the hare and the tortoise so if there is a graphic and it says the story of the hare and the tortoise people already know the story so how do you make it interesting to them do you make it animated then it, it can rely then one might have to think of different strategies of format of you know how, how do we tell this story that is already popular another question is if it's not popular do people have any interest in it so one of the things that we do is we check on google trends and that's a useful tool it helps to see are people searching for these keywords are they searching for this now google doesn't always give the right results when it comes to art but we have used it in the past to see if there is enough interest. When it comes to museums and cultural storytelling, this is not the most reliable tool because if people don't have interest, it does not mean you will not tell the story. You will still tell the story to generate interest in that. So that's also sometimes a, an editorial call to take that, yes, we want to generate interest in the story. People are not searching for it. People don't know about it. So how do we drive this? That's when we use a, you know, 
really shocking statement or something that is absolutely intriguing to people that uh, this is the world's second largest painting or uh, you know then people are like hey I don't know about this and I want to know about this so they would listen so that's when these kind of strategies come into play um, so similarly another strategy is to look at the timeliness how important is it to react to situations with a story in your museum uh, we've done this in the past a lot for instance um, you know maybe a huge celebrity wedding is making the rounds and it's becoming really popular and that people are consistently discussing it on every social media channel that hey this wedding is happening and so much money is being spent that's when one can go back to say a painting in the Mughal period which says this was the most expensive wedding back in the 18th century or the 17th century this much was spent in that time and this is how it happened there's a similar story we once told when there was a political campaign and a lot of conversation about how the media crafts an image and there's a lot of visual propaganda happening and so we used that as an absolutely wonderful opportunity to talk about this incident when the British had just, uh, you know, established their rule in India and they held a really spectacular event. And so we delved deep into that event to show how this was more of a visual propaganda that the media was covering through books, through illustrations, through prints, through um, newspapers who came like you know to cover this event and what was the narrative that was being crafted in a way what it does to the audience is share that this has happened in the past there is a pattern to it and it's happening right now as well so it's for the audience to understand it's not something you explicitly say out loud so that's how storytelling would serve different purposes in this case um we looked at the timeliness of, I mean, this was uh, way back during the US elections, I think when Bernie Sanders became, sitting in his mittens, became a phenomena on the internet. And so we used that opportunity to position him in a crowd of, uh, you know, sitting exactly with, with the, in an Indian painting, which would appeal to people. And it became, again, really popular. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that people would like to share in the next subsequent tweet, of course, there was the information about the painting and link to the article story. So that was different. So the thing about um, storytelling is that whether it's timely, whether it serves a certain purpose and what format can we adapt it to. So like we were talking about the hair and the tortoise example, it might be really nice to see a flip book about it. It may be nice to see an animated story about it and it might be entirely new to hear an audio drama around it. It's the format that keeps the audience engaged. So on the right side, uh, you see that uh, this is an example from the DAG Museum in India, which I really admire. Not only did they look at a new format, but they looked at the format being a way to build their community. They were very new to the social media platform at the time when they started with this. And one of the things that they did is invite popular uh, cultural um, practitioners. So whether it's an author or whether it's someone who runs a website or something to just come and look at a story that they have developed, read it out with expression. And um, that's the story. So in, in the video actually shows the artwork in great detail, but then there is audio. And people who are new, to DAG being on Instagram and like, okay, I follow this author and the author is talking about a painting and it's it's different because they don't expect this. So it's new, the format itself. And it also brings someone you admire into a different light because if I'm fond of an author and they're doing an audio you know, explanation, I would like to hear it for them, if not just the art. So sometimes you bring in people uh, to share your story, who also might have a certain kind of audience, a certain kind of following that exists. Um, so, so that's how they did it. And if you notice, all their videos have the same logo, the same font, which is what was the consistency point that I was talking about earlier on in this presentation, that 
one of the things that is absolutely crucial in what we have found is the consistency of our tone. Um, and the Heritage Lab has uh, been known now to make it simple and easy. So we are not known for a really um, academic language of art or anything like that, but it's people already know oh, it's playful, it's easy to understand. But that's something that we have not said ever. We've never said things like, oh, follow us for easy art information or jargonless information stories. We've not, not said that. It's it's in the tone that you establish it and let it grow on people. Um, there are times when I've heard from people what they think and I'm like, oh, I wasn't intending that, but it's great to know that that's the impression that they have of the Heritage Lab. So in this, you see that there's a graphic consistency. So we have like um, videos that we've done with a certain art gallery to bring their collections into spotlight. But it's really about the person in the portrait and their life story. But it's told in a certain format and a certain tone consistently. Um, so if, if it's like, you know, your Instagram tone is very different from your website tone and it's very different from your actual space, then there is a discord and the audience doesn't feel as welcomed or, you know, it, they're suddenly not as comfortable with the switch. So that's something that we discovered as well as we went along. Um, this brings in one of the aspects about the community that, you know, just as DAG did this, invited people to start telling their stories, uh, to start telling DAG's stories, but, you know, using their own expressions. There's also a thing about how do you use social media to um, let others talk and um, let others help you with that social aspect. Some of the museums that we've worked with started with sharing their own collection stories, etc. But then how is that different from the website or an editorial or a newsletter? Social media uh, storytelling gives this absolute wonderful opportunity to um, really let others share and talk and connect with them. Like I said at the beginning, it's a way for us to experiment and see what do people say about these stories? What role does, you know, different kind of media formats or multimedia, audio, video, what role does this play? So if we are doing a campaign, for example, this is, we give a prompt to the audience to say, hey, this is the hashtag campaign that we are doing and we want to hear from you. So they share their favorite paintings, architecture, anything they know. It gives us an insight into what people already know and what might be the gap that is yet to be filled. So when we actually do an editorial um, series on Sufis, so this particular campaign that you see on screen is about Sufi Thursdays, um, because in India, Sufism is, it, it's, it's Thursdays are like a day, um, you know, it's, it's an auspicious day for the Sufi people also. And uh, it's, so we called it Sufi Thursdays. And it's also, you know, good for people to remember because it's Thursdays and you have a word that clicks in like, oh, it's Sufi Thursdays. So people started to share this and this went on for a while. By the end of it, we know exactly what kind of Sufi stories are already popular, which ones are you know yet to be told. So that's when the editorial team plans or calendar is planned accordingly. Um, so that's how we actually use social media to experiment and hear and listen to the audience. But this is also to say that how do we make it simple for the audience to participate in these kind of campaigns? Um, we realize this that there could be a good way could be to have people tell stories on social media that we could then take to the website instead of asking them to come to the website click somewhere fill a form write their story and figure out the you know uh, layout and the user interface it was easy for us to use an interface that they are already used to and say hey why don't you put in your um, story here and when you write the Heritage Lab Publish, it gets submitted to us as a draft to review. So once it's reviewed, then it's published. And um, then we can also tell the person that it has been published here. This pretty much works in the same way as a thread role app could work. 
uh, unroll app could work so people are already familiar with how this works they don't need more instruction it's almost natural to them um and so we started doing a lot of these activities where people can be involved to tell a story the bernie sanders example told us about how people loved memes and how humor had potential so we created a meme maker and the thing about the meme maker is that people can use open access artwork to make their meme but when we share it we share it with their name and so on instagram kind of a platform people with a similar interest start to follow each other also because when we say hey this meme was created by xyz other people who love that kind of humor can follow xyz start to chat and they, there's a sense of recollection every time you hear xyz's name on our instagram for example so the meme maker for us became a way to um, you know just build a community and have them all share these things so that's what we do even on twitter and on um, you know we already know that after this sufi thursdays campaign who are the people who really like to share these kind of things so we create a separate list we keep tagging each other even though we've never met in person it's become like a little community of people we know will support the art kind of an art and cultural kind of um storytelling this is the part that is really very important <laughs> because uh we have to uh, no no strategy for storytelling can be complete without knowing whether we are going in the right direction and that's what feedback is for you get feedback you work rework iterate see that okay this has clearly not worked you improve right um but but this is a really difficult um point because different institutions have different needs and the storytelling strategy can be part of different kinds of motivations so for instance are you telling stories to um you know make people come to the institution are you telling stories because you want to build more participation are you telling stories because um i mean by participation i meant in your existing programs or workshops um or are you trying to you know cater to a big mission that says oh, we are here to provide knowledge and share um knowledge with everybody so it really depends on what the main mission for the storytelling is for us um we've experimented with different metrics uh, whereas for it is important to understand okay that this story had these many likes and these many saves we look at the number of people who saved that particular um um post when we know that there's this this post had a high number of people saving it we know that this has potential to become a resource this has to become a learning resource because people are saving this they need to refer to this again this definitely needs to be complemented by a website story so that it's always there In instagram you lose things so it al always has to be there but if there were more things where you had more comments and then you would see what kind of questions people have in the comments so what are they saying in the comments so you know that if you were to do a story on it what kind of an angle it should take what is the interest in this kind of a story does it have i mean if it has a propensity to cause a lot of friction and bad comments then maybe it's best to stay away from that angle it's the kind of insights that you get from the insights that are already there on social media so it's not um for museums that i have often consulted with i i don't suggest usually that they look at metrics as just pure numbers and full stop the the metrics and the numbers have to inform the editorial strategy or the storytelling strategy further and uh, similarly um the other two which are more emotion based uh, i think one was for our gift making program that we um did where we had dag museums again open up um 13 of their artworks for public use and remixing as gifts and that was during the pandemic it was also at a time when we thought that people are only online so we um released that and we measured that through talkwalker which is a popular measurement tool 
and we saw that the emotions that it generated were that of joy and surprise and that was great because this is during a pandemic and if people are feeling joyous and surprised because of your efforts then the gift making serves a certain purpose and gifts are for joy and you know that that so it meets the purpose then of actually doing that uh, activity and similarly on the right you see a pie chart uh, which is based on um, you know these little emojis that we have at the end of our all our articles now it's a very recent feature so every time someone reads they also share that okay this is uh, useful this was something that they have more questions about so it gives us a certain kind of insight there um so yeah i mean i think what what is something that is important to remember is that digital storytelling because of the nature of digital is always changing it is um it is dynamic so it's important to keep changing the digital storytelling strategy as new platforms emerge as new tools emerge and stay curious and uh keep refining and working on these um these skills so it's what really helps us build our relationship with people who are listening so yeah that's that's exactly what um our experience has been at uh the heritage lab and just the last thing i want to end this presentation with is that no matter what tools and what digital insight tools that we are using one has to remember that the, the at the other end of the screen is a human person so it has to resonate more it has to be more authentic and it has to be a resonant experience for them so um that's uh, that's what um uh, my presentation was here and i hope that this experience um helps some of you um i'm also here for questions sometime and if if we can't take all questions then my email address is right here i know i've already heard from uh, some of you who were going to participate today and it'll be really nice to hear from you and if the heritage lab or i can contribute to your storytelling um endeavors that would also be great um so yeah with that i would like to thank um, nemo mira rebecca and the whole team for making this such a, a smooth experience thank you yeah thank you medavi thank you so much for this uh, input and uh, for taking us to india and the indian museum world for this past hour um i see some questions are popping up uh we have a few more minutes uh, but also uh for everyone else we can share the presentation and for everyone who um there was one ellie from scotland uh, <laughs> um this video will uh, be online in the next one or two weeks um so you can review that and of course get in touch with medavi directly um to share experience or ask more questions. Um, yeah, Medavi, you mentioned one um, insight tool that was a bit, uh, maybe you can just say that again or type that in the, in the chat. Um, I also didn't really hear that. Did I mention Talk Walker? I um, it's yeah. Talk Walker. Um, it's a tool I used to also be on the team for Museum Week when it was really new and it was a hashtag campaign that brought people, museums together. Uh, so we used Talk Walker at that time to understand insights from all over the world. So I can definitely recommend that Talk Walker has some really um, uh, great, uh, it's, it's a good tool, it's, it's a great tool, yeah. And then we have uh, more specific questions, and I don't know if that um, if you have the time to to even answer that. Uh, someone is asking uh, about um, how do you work with uh, children or young people, um, and if playing uh, something uh, is something important on this regard. And someone else asked, uh, uh, how do you work uh, with seniors or <laughs> retired <laughs> communities who are not so used uh, with the digital world? So um, maybe, yeah, you have a 
Absolutely. Not so ready for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's uh, fascinating. Both sides. I can start <laughs> with the senior citizens' uh, question first, uh, perhaps. Uh, I think for our experience, where our experience has been largely with the South Asian Indian community, uh, a lot of people love to use WhatsApp, uh, especially like uh, you know. I think demographically, I could say over the age of 55 onwards, WhatsApp is something that's really easy for everybody to engage with and share and comment. So um, we do have uh, communities like these um, using uh, different groups. Earlier, we had a WhatsApp group. Now we can convert it into a community. That's great because uh, WhatsApp has this tool so people can respond and engage. We also have at the Heritage Lab have a Telegram community, which was not very successful because Telegram as a tool was not so popular in India at that point in time when we started it. But these kind of apps make it more easy for people to engage in quizzes, in polls, in sending something they have written um, or even their own photographs um, if they want to do that. And the articles are also simultaneously broadcasted um, whenever we come up with an article or a series or even our newsletters are shared uh, in this manner with everybody. So there is a certain kind of, um, we found that there is one tool that helps. Mm -hmm. So we've stuck to that. Um, so that's that's perhaps my question for uh, the, uh, the first part. With children, um, again, we face a problem because in schools where we work, uh, dig devices are not allowed. Students are not allowed to use these. But we did find a way around it because digital humanities itself is an up and coming field in education in India as well as in other countries. And what we try to do is focus on creative things like digital zine making or comic mm -hmm. making, um, you know, building digital skills also. So, for instance, uh, when we were making the GIF uh, campaign, we did encourage students to attend workshops and how to make gifts. And when we did take a feedback in the end of the campaign publicly from Instagram and different channels, we put up our feedback forms. It emerged to us that 64% people felt this was an opportunity to learn a new digital skill. This was not part of our plan. We had not intended to share a new digital skill, but it was one of the unintended outcomes of the program. So what our research has shown is that young students, um, especially I also have done uh, museum education consulting with different schools in India where we take museum objects to the classroom, uh, not literally, but as a way to teach them about curriculum topics that exist. And students are meant to innovate on that and respond to it and create something based on it. Uh, what we have found is that not only does this build excitement in students to actually go to the museum and see it, but also be inspired and then create something of their own, uh, whether it is using a digital tool or not, uh, is really on mostly the resource. It's a resource-based question that um, students really enjoy these. And apart from that, we've had different quizzes, different kinds of short, you know, comic-based things that students are used to. And during these endeavors, we have seen that students are most happy when they get to share a story and it gets, uh, you know, it gets featured by the museum. Yeah. Um, it once led us to having uh, the a museum do a children's takeover in the sense that the children would curate and lead people through a walk in the museum. Mm. So how do you see this museum through the children's eyes? Uh, so it really had capacity we saw. Um, to engage students also. I, I hope that answered um, the question, but- did Thank you for the answer, it's yeah. the, it's the answer. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you. There are a lot of thank yous in the chat, uh, Medavi, really. Um, it was a great pleasure to have you here. And um, yeah, please all um, connect, exchange, and um, yeah, we are looking forward for the next time and uh, wishing a good day to everyone. Thank you, Medavi. Thank you all. <laughs>